So I'm with Adam Brown. He is the uh, CEO of the North Superior Healthcare Group. Hi, Adam. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Kim. Thanks for having me today. So here we are eight months later after I last talked to you. We're, um, I guess, would you call, say we're in the second wave, with multiple variants being reported, and we've had increasing cases in the area. How are we doing? Well, it's, that's been a fast eight months, hasn't it, for sure. <laughs> no. uh, it, it's been a year. 2020 is uh, behind us, thankfully, and uh, we're into 2021. And, you know, real close local here, we've had only one case in Terrace Bay. Uh, so that was that's really good positive news for, for this area. Marathon, of course, has had a couple of breaks, and uh, we had an outbreak in November and December, about 17 cases total of that outbreak. And, Everything successfully resolved with no hospitalizations or any serious illness out of that. And more recently in Marathon, uh, we have a fairly large outbreak at the Ballard camp. Uh, of course, uh, 25 cases to date. Uh, seems to be well isolated to the camp. And uh, uh, 24 of the 25 impacted employees have been uh, uh, relocated to Thunder Bay. So they're in isolation in Thunder Bay. There was one local Ballard employee uh, that is isolated in the community, but no sign of any community spread of, or seemingly uh, any high level of risk in the community uh, from that. Uh, to the north of us, uh, of course, we have uh, quite a few cases in Greenstone. I don't have the exact number, but uh, some community spread in uh, in Ganugaming, Long Lac 58, Long Lac, Geraldton, and I believe Aeroland. So uh, concerning up there as well. Why all of a sudden we're seeing an increase in like, let's say certain industries, for instance. I noticed in Terrace as well, there was a uh, some kind of a chat about it being possibly related to the mill there and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I've heard none in, in the mill uh, at this point, so that's that's good news. And, and to, to pinpoint mining, I don't think is quite fair either, but certainly any kind of congregated uh, workplace or living place is a risk. That's that's just a reality. Mm -hmm. In the Ballard case, there was 268 employees living in a camp-style setup, um, you know, eating meals together, uh, potentially living in, in fairly close confines. Uh, in the case of the outbreak at Valid, it was uh, uh, identified as office employees. So mm -hmm. there was uh, upwards of 35 people in their office complex in, in, in the camp, and uh, that's where the spread was. Mm -hmm. So it's real easy to to forget, right? Uh, you know, safety is, I heard a really good expression the other day, that safety is not a dimmer switch, it's either on or off. So if you're in a, you know, Kim, if we, if we were beside each other right now, we would be expected to be wearing this 100 percent of the time right exactly. and it takes that one little slip where you jump up for a coffee you know get off off your desk and jump up for a coffee and and forget to put your mask on if you're infected now you've potentially infected the whole office and mm. that seems to be uh the risk in in uh, congregate settings S certain maybe occupations in general that are transient by nature that require sure. people to go in and out of areas that's what sure I and that, that that's a hundred percent fair comment again referencing back to Ballard uh, Ballard has been really quite proactive actually uh, they set up a testing facility in Thunder Bay uh, post the Christmas break so all of their camps they have camps in Marathon and Wawa and White River and Nipigan and, and further north as well uh, they're involved in a number of projects and uh, as they demobilized for the Christmas break, when they remobilized, every employee came through their testing facility in Thunder Bay. And, you know, testing is not perfect, uh, particularly in the early stages of incubation of, of the virus. So they had, in the Marathon case, they had one employee who came back from, I don't know where, I don't want to pick on any province because I don't know where they came from, who might have been infected the day before they traveled, right? And yeah. if they were tested in Thunder Bay on day one or day two of their incubation period, the testing protocol would not pick up on that. Mm. And so they tested negative in, in the city, traveled to Marathon, and you know five, six days later became symptomatic and were retested and were positive. Yeah. In the meantime, of course, they perhaps didn't wear their mask when they should have and had impacted, uh, well, in this case, 24 other folks in the camp. So mm. Travel is a risk for sure. And, and we, we're seeing you know, rumblings uh, from our provincial and federal counterparts about uh, you know, tightening down travel even further. And the stay-at-home order is, is, is a good example of that, and we're seeing positive trends in the province and the country. Uh, because of that, we heard from Manitoba today has introduced a 14-day uh, quarantine if you go into that province, and uh, the U.S. has introduced a 14-day quarantine for travelers going into the U.S. now, and so it's going to get tighter before it gets looser, I think, and yeah. I think in the short term, that's a good thing. Honestly. Well, back at the beginning, you were one of the first people I talked to that actually speculated on the possibility mm -hmm. of interprovincial travel and getting locked down. You were the first the person who had actually mentioned that. So you're way ahead of the curve on that, that's for sure. Well, there, it's it's a challenge, right? There's there's We live in a democratic society and expect freedoms. And in the same breath, uh, we also want to be safe and want our 
particularly our elderly parents and neighbors to be safe. So it's it's a real balance. And I, I don't envy any of the politicians having to make those difficult decisions. It's very tough. And even uh, local municipality wise, it takes so long for them to react to something because if you have your typical council meetings every two weeks and then Ford makes an announcement on one week and by the time you're implementing stuff, it's like you're constantly chasing your tail. And I know the issue with the arena, for instance, um, a lot of people were deciding open the arenas, don't open the arenas. And in early December, late November, it looked like they were going to just open up and things were different. Then over the Christmas period, things were changing. And now we're going back into a let's keep the arenas closed scenario. That, that's exactly right. And a number of the municipalities uh, enacted a state of emergency during the first wave, which allows allows them to react faster, of course. Mm -hmm. But again, that's that's a difficult decision to make. And it takes away uh, the democratic process, really, in, in municipalities as well. And that's that's not an easy decision. And it's not supported by a lot of folks either. And, and I, I, I get that. Yeah. You know, democracy is important and freedom is important. So um, we're up here in the north in a very rural area, and I'd just like to ask you a little bit information about the, uh, now that this vaccine is, is coming onto, onto the, our shores soon, um, what exactly would it be like rolling out vaccines, and I'm especially thinking about the one that needs to be stored at minus 80 some degrees uh, yeah. in a rural area, especially the small towns. Maybe you could just talk about um, the uh, plan for vaccine rollout, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, sure. So the vaccine rule has actually started in our area already, fortunately. Um, in Thunder Bay, the Pfizer vaccine has been delivered uh, for a couple of weeks now. And as at time of our interview here today, uh, there's been 2,600, so 2,600 doses delivered in Thunder Bay, uh, predominantly directed towards long-term care residents and staff. So the real vulnerable population of our communities. Um, in Sioux Lookout, Moderna has been distributed. So in the community of Sioux Lookout, again, directed towards uh, long-term care residents and staff, and then mobilizing staff to go to the far north. Uh, I believe there's 31 or 26, I'll get the numbers wrong, uh, First Nation reserves in the far north of Sioux Lookout. Um, we're hearing as well, uh, hot off the presses today, that uh, Fort Francis has been receiving the Moderna vaccine effective this morning. Uh, uh, geared towards our long-term care home. And Fort Francis, no Rainy River area, has had a bit of a struggle here in the last couple of weeks uh, yeah. with an outbreak as well. Um, and finally, Red Lake, uh, also to the west of us, uh, has been receiving or will be receiving their vaccines this week. Uh, locally here in, in Terrace Bay, uh, we can look forward to vaccines. I, I can't give you a definitive date, uh, Kim, but uh, the week of February 1st, we're being told that to expect uh, the Moderna vaccine again, directed to our long-term care population in Terrace Bay. And uh, you, you had asked about the, the minus 80 uh, vaccine, and that's the Pfizer vaccine that came in. Yeah, yeah it's, it has some very stringent um, uh, storage and transportation requirements. And, and it's related to the lipid, which is a fat that surrounds the mRNA vaccine itself. It, uh, it degrades easily, so it has to be frozen and then just thawed just prior to the, to the inoculation process. The Moderna vaccine also is stored in, in the lipid, which is a fat composite, and uh, it has a, a bit better stability and, and can be stored. I believe it's around minus 20 centigrade. Uh, it's much easier to, to transport to our uh, rural facilities. So in Terrace Bay at the McCausen Hospital or wilkes Terrace, we do not have an, a minus 80 degree fridge. Uh, we do have a minus 20 degree fridge, though, so more likely to receive the Moderna uh, here in the next week or so. Yeah, because I was thinking the uh, logistics of getting that kind of technology into rural areas where it's small, small populations, it would be just crazy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I wanted to ask you about vaccine. I keep hearing people saying, if you're getting uh, one particular one, because we were talking about booster shots in a while, and the time <laughs> in between the intervals that seem to have been changing around between getting your second shot, um, there wouldn't be, they're not interchangeable, are they? I don't believe that. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not a clinician, Kim, so I, I can't talk about the science too, too much, but I don't think it's been well studied whether you can, you know, flip flop on the Moderna and, and Pfizer vaccine, and it's certainly not recommended. So, uh, you know, when we do as, as uh, average citizens or communities receive the Moderna vaccine in, in the first inoculation, we will be given the Moderna vaccine for the second inoculation as well. If for by some miracle Pfizer is able to be transported, it'll be the same thing. Pfizer for one and Pfizer for two. Yeah. And now there are other vaccines on the on the horizon, potentially. Uh, AstraZeneca has been approved in a number of loca uh, localities, uh, particularly UK. Uh, AstraZeneca in, in uh, collaboration with Oxford University has got a 
a uh, vaccine. There's also a Johnson and Johnson vaccine that's that's close to being uh, approved, and it's a one-shot vaccine. So the more traditional vaccines that we're used to for the flu and things like that, uh, with really st still quite high efficacy and uh, and quite easy transportation and storage uh, requirements. So. What we end up getting here in, in the second and third uh, uh, phases of the vaccine rollout is, is a bit of a mystery at this point. You've touched yeah. on uh, priorities of, as far as who would be vaccinated first and uh, a sort of a short list. Is that set in stone or is that sort of per area as well? You know, at a high level, it's 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 set in stone in that uh, the federal and provincial governments have, have all agreed and they've you know, had uh, ethicists involved in this discussion. But the uh, number one priority is to prevent uh, death and serious illness. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, the statistics are very clear. The death and serious illness is predominantly happening in the elderly population, and particularly in our long-term care homes. And, and those folks, you know, typically are 80 plus years old. Yeah. So that is the number one priority, full stop. Uh, and then, you know, frontline workers, healthcare workers, that sort of thing, are exposed to to the potentially exposed to the vaccine on a on a daily basis, and they have some prior priority as well. But really, it's going to be a gradient based on age. So somebody that's 85 is much likely going to get much more likely to get the vaccine early compared to a young fellow like yourself, you know, a 29 year old like yourself, uh, you'll be further down the list because the statistics show that you may get COVID. Uh, chances are you're not going to get seriously sick from it. Mm -hmm. uh, another priority population, Kim, is the Indigenous population, and particularly the the Indigenous population that's in the remote fly-in type uh, communities. And we have many, many of those in Ontario. And the simple reason is, uh, there's lots of reasons, and they're not simple, but uh, access to healthcare is much more limited in, in those remote uh, communities. Um, housing is generally, I, I don't want to, to to categorize everybody in this uh, in this category but uh, housing is generally smaller and packed so you know you have five six seven eight people living in a relatively small house and uh, health uh, statuses are generally lower so more comorbidities that uh, present risks with with COVID so those indigenous populations will have priority on, on vaccines as well. Let's talk a little bit about uh, post-vaccination assuming this rollout happens and everybody's uh, getting the shots maybe that's something actually we should mention what would you say and, and you don't have to comment on if you don't want to, if you don't think it's your place um, to people who are thinking about possibly not getting the vaccine I know there's a lot of people concerned that this was it was maybe rolled out too quickly there have been reported side effects um, like with any vaccine actually sure. um, is it wise do you think for people not to seriously consider getting the vaccine well, it's a very personal decision, but you know, I am personally going to take the vaccine, so I can say that publicly. Uh, my organization, North Superior Healthcare Group, is is publicly promoting the vaccines uh, when they do arrive. Uh, vaccines are are miracles if we think about it. You know, if you go back, you know, 60, 70, 80 years ago, polio was a thing. You know, most of us don't remember that. Vaccines fixed that problem, didn't they? Um, then there's, you know, numerous examples of where vaccines fix problems, and unfortunately, there's lots of misinformation, particularly in the area of, in the era of social media. Uh, there's some misinformed um, uh, folks who, who are very vocal in their anti-vax uh, views. Uh, but I encourage, you know, anybody that's tuning in here on, on your show, Kim, to to do your research. Don't re don't rely on the Facebook threads. You know, do your homework. Go on the Thunder Bay District Health Unit website. Go on CDC or Health Canada or any of those official websites and, and do your homework. And uh, vaccines are the only real way out of this pandemic. Uh, we can't we can't lock ourselves up in a room for the rest of our lives. That won't work, obviously. Um, so, yeah, I publicly promote vaccines. Uh, again, I'm not a clinician. Kim, you're not a clinician. Uh, but when we, if we're unfortunate enough to get cancer, we trust our doctors to treat us well and inject us with some really powerful medications, mm -hmm. which in, a, in the wrong environment are poisons. But we trust our doctors to do that. We trust them to fix our broken legs. We trust them to do a lot of things to us. And our pharmacists and everybody in the, in the healthcare industry I'm not understanding why you wouldn't trust your clinicians, your doctors, your scientists to give you good advice on vaccines. Yeah. Okay. Perhaps yeah. that's too far into politics. Unfortunately, it's become a very political issue. If you look how people yeah. are divided, not just in general lately in society, yeah. but um, yeah. anti-masking, anti-vaccine. It's like uh, people all, you, we all have our own different opinions about what's right and wrong, but there yeah. has to be some common sense somewhere along the line that kicks yeah, in. Well, 
Yeah, and and I under I truly understand COVID fatigue. That's a real thing. We've been in this for a year already, right? And people are not happy, including myself. I don't like having to wear a mask. You know, I went for a walk the other day to go to the grocery store a marathon, and I got it's about three kilometers from my house. I got a kilometer and a half and went. Where's my mask? And had to turn around. It's that's frustrating, right? And yeah. it's frustrating that I don't get to sp spend time with my friends and family. And yeah. um, and in some cases, it's it's really sad. You know, if you have uh, elderly family that are in in a long term care home or you know in another community in particular, we yeah. don't get to go visit them right now, and that's that's not fun. So I yeah. I get it. Um, there are absolutely some contraindications. Anybody that has uh, serious allergies, I apologize for that. Uh, overhead pager. Anybody that has serious allergies, that carries an EpiPen, for example, you won't be eligible for a vaccine because that is one of the side effects. Uh, but besides that, the known side effects are very minor. You might have a, you know, a sore arm, you might get a, a small fever and that sort of thing. That's your body reacting to the vaccine and, and creating the antibodies that we need to fight COVID. So that's, that's your body doing well when you get those minor side effects. People have this idea that, oh, I've got my shot, so I'm fine now. I can throw away my yeah. mask. I can go outside, do whatever I want. I think that mindset needs to be addressed at some point where people should realize that, yes, we have vaccines, but it doesn't make you invulnerable. It's not a cure. We don't even know how long they're even going to work. But yet there's a whole bunch of people out there who seem to be jumping on the wagon. I've got my vaccine and I'm invulnerable now. I can go out and I can do what I want. I think yeah. there has to be some more uh, some consideration for that too. I mean, obviously... It makes sense that just because you've been vaccinated doesn't mean you could not maybe expose other people to um, to uh, an, a type of virus that you may be carrying, even though you've been injected. Am I correct in saying that? Like, yeah, you're 100% you're correct. And a couple of points. Uh, no vaccine and no medication is 100% effective. And unfortunately, right? Uh, so not everybody will be protected. Now, the this particular vaccine through Moderna and Pfizer are new. The technology is not new, though. mRNA is not a new technology. It's about a decade old. But these particular vaccines are new. And there is going to be ongoing scientific study on the efficacy of, of the vaccine, the duration that it lasts, whether we might need booster shots every year, all that sort of thing uh, will be studied for, for many, many years until we can really get this right. And uh, the virus will mutate like every virus in the world always does. And so maybe like the annual flu shot, maybe we're going to have an annual COVID shot. We don't know that at, at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, but with regards to near-term uh, vaccine issues, mm -hmm. when you get inoculated with your vaccine, it provides you protection only as your body reacts to the vaccine. So with an MR mRNA, it's sending a signal to your body to create antibodies. And there's some great videos online to to explain it to the layperson, and again, I'm not a clinician, so I'm not even going to try it. Right. Uh, it's not altering your DNA. None of this funky genetic stuff is going on. Right. Uh, but your body needs time to build up to react to the vaccine, which is telling it to create antibodies right. to the COVID. That just takes time, right. and particularly with Moderna and Pfizer, the first vaccine, first dose gives you some protection, and I. I don't know what the number is, 50%, 60%, who knows. Uh, but the second one gives that, that oomph that you need that, that to get it up to the 95% efficacy that we've seen in the media. But it takes time. It might take, again, this is open to, to study still, but it might take a couple of weeks till your body has done its thing, done its magic to, to combat it. So people ask, why did I get the vaccine? And I still have to wear a mask or I still can't go visit grandma because mm -hmm. you're not there yet. You're not safe yet, right? So yeah. give it time, continue to listen to the scientists there. They're the ones that get paid the big dollars to, to help study this for us and give us advice. Yep. Um, what would you say to people who uh, keep saying, we can't wait for everything to get back to normal? Well, I, I'm one of them. <laughs> we may not ever get back to what is considered normal from the past. Yeah. We have to learn how to adapt and go forward. And, just and we do. And this is with, with anything, Elias. But I'm, a, I'm an eternal optimist. And again, the, there's lots of brilliant people working on this. And we're going to figure out a way to adapt to this virus like we've adapted to SARS and we've adapted to H1N1 and we've adapted to you name the number of you know Spanish flu if we go back to 1918 we figure out a way to get over it humans are brilliant creatures right we're, we're not uh, we're not amoeba we, we get to think and we get to trial and and experiment and, and we will figure this out and we'll get back to whatever normal looks like uh, at some point in the near future hopefully the near future uh, and get to Maybe, Kim, I'll get to come to your house for a coffee at some point so we don't have to do this on Zoom. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> well, Adam, I'll let you go then, but it was a real pleasure talking to you, and thank you for the updates and the information. Uh, it's Adam Brown, who is the uh, 
North Superior Healthcare Group CEO. And it was all, as usual, a pleasure talking to you. And I hope to see yeah, you it's a real pleasure, too. Kim. Thanks for uh, for checking in. And uh, don't be a stranger for eight months next time, okay? Well, I hope not. <laughs> all right. Take care.